thank you for coming. You will notice that there's a slight change in uh, the kind of program uh, and what we are going to do in the lead up to the, uh, to the dinner. So, unfortunately, Arvind Subramaniam, the Chief Economic Advisor, uh, who was scheduled to speak at 6.30, uh, he has been called away by the Finance Minister exactly at the same time. Uh, I wish we had two Chief Economic Advisors. Uh, uh, so he, he can't be here at this time. So uh, at our request, the chair of the session, Chetan, uh, is here, and he will he speak. And I, we requested the three other participants. That you can see Thomas, uh, who will be speaking tomorrow, Stephen, who spoke in the morning, as, as well as Amar, who just spoke in the previous session, to engage in a kind of conversation uh, with us uh, on you know, their thoughts and what they think about uh, the process and the effectiveness of G20, something that we've heard in the morning, but also you could engage with them in a conversation uh, that could be much more informal. We'll resume the formal discussions uh, tomorrow morning. But I thought we've had a very engaging session, starting with uh, Dr. Panagaria and then concluding with the infrastructure session. It was very, very engaging. And of course, there's a lot of uh, discussion on the effectiveness of G20 or the lack of it. But I think that's a part, uh, that's the nature of the beast, given that uh, it's a large and heterogeneous entity. But it did, uh, did what it had to do when it was uh, created. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to request Chetan, uh, since uh, he was going to chair this session, to kind of talk about uh, the effectiveness, what he thinks is the effectiveness or in his models, effectiveness of monetary and fiscal policy and how you know, their effectiveness can be leveraged better through a coordinated approach. And then once uh, Chetan has spoken for about, I guess, 10 minutes, Chetan? Yeah, yeah? 10 minutes, and then we could uh, have a conversation with the other speakers on questions that you could raise or prompts from me or, or questions that you could raise and then we could have uh, maybe a you know, 45, 30 to 45 minute session in the lead up to the dinner. So thank you very much and apologies for the last minute change. Uh, but I think we've got four sub adequate substitutes uh, uh, from the session, for this session. But it was something that we could not kind of anticipate. It was not in our hands. So thank you very much, Chetan. Uh, floor is yours. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for coming. I hope we put on an equally exciting show as Arvind would have. Um, so we hope not to disappoint. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, and kind of from a vantage point of being an academic, um, uh, a more academic uh, take on uh, the scope for monetary and fiscal cooperation amongst the G20. In other words, um, what does the academic literature suggest about the scope for cooperation? Um, what plays out? Um, some of the challenges confronting India and um, where does theory help us in, in understanding what the scope for cooperation is and, and, and where there isn't? And um, the reason why I want to speak about this is, is because I work mostly in the area of macro fiscal um, and, and, and monetary policy. So this is a subject that is close to my heart. So let me paint the, let me paint the, the, the following picture. Um, let's go back to the 2008 crisis, which, um, and dealing with it. And, and we all recognize, and everybody on this panel certainly, that this was a textbook example of successful uh, international cooperation. And irrespective of, of which country you looked at, um, countries responded by cutting interest rates. They injected liquidity into financial markets. Um, some of the major advanced economies Im implemented unconventional monetary measures. And almost everyone um, expanded fiscal policy. And then you had a secondary set of measures. You had the Fed extending swap currency lines, mostly with other advanced economies and with some other um, EMEs. But then when you move to 2010, things become a little more contentious. And you can see the emergence of possibly a first round of criticism. You see tremendous balance sheet expansion by the Fed Reserve because of QE, um, which the first effect of that, or the major effect of that, was a depreciation of the US dollar against 
many EME currencies. Um, capital flooded into EMEs, and at that point, a couple of years out, the EME growth rates were still strong. So capital flooded into EMEs, and um, uh, Brazilian, the Brazilian finance minister, for instance, Guido Mantega, accused the U.S. of being engaged in a currency war, and he accused the U.S of countering deficient domestic demand by basically boosting exports by depreciating uh, the currency through, through QE, i.e. a beggar thy neighbor policy. And many of the BRIC economies were visibly uh, affected by this. And the implication that came out of this criticism was that the Fed was basically failing to take into account the implication of QE on EMEs. And therefore what followed was that policy would have been better served had there been more coordination between advanced economies like the US and the EMDs on, on the other hand. Then there emerges a second round of criticism which comes around the taper tantrum period, which is summer of 2013 or in the um, run up to it, when Ben Bernanke suggests that the US Fed might soon begin tapering its purchases of government and mortgage backed securities. Um, because of the prospects of, of, of a higher US interest rate, Capital flows now reverse direction. Okay? Equity prices and exchange rates plummet, and many EME central banks were forced to raise interest rates and use up hard-earned currency reserves. And then there's a third blow when uh, the taper actually happens, um, and this is around December 2013, and Mantega again criticizes the Fed's communication strategy as being inadequate. Um, our own governor, uh, Raghuram Rajan, at the time also criticized U.S. Fed policy as being excessive and that the reversal of QE was creating financial risk for other countries, including India. So what emerges out of this is a notion that the failure to curtail cross-border externalities associated with national policymaking was leading to an inefficient global outcome. From the standpoint of the U.S., I guess there are a few key issues here. The first is, and I guess this is also part of the debate on model uncertainty, because we just don't know what the right model is, um, that because there's uncertainty about the structure of the world economy, um, this uncertainty uh, feeds back into our understanding of how international policy adjustments have different effects. And uh, this is a big issue. The second issue, of course, is that internalizing a lot of the effects that I've just spoken about were not easy. And certainly from the standpoint of advanced economies, it was not clear whether countries would be better off with internationally coordinated policies or just basically telling uh, other countries to, to, put their, to put their houses in order. Now, suggesting to countries that they should put their houses in order is also based on the notion that the gains from coordination are not large. And um, if you go back to the literature, the two kind of main foundation papers in, in the theory, theory for policy coordination or the gains from international policy coordination are two papers in the 60s, uh, one, sorry, one in the late 60s and one in the, in the late 70s. And uh, this is uh, Richard Cooper's uh, uh, 1968 paper and Koichi Hamada in 19, 1976. And, and these papers create the early academic foundation for, for international policy coordination, essentially suggesting that the gains may not be that large. And then the literature went into a, a little bit of revival in the 80s. But what critics began to observe about the Hamada result was that, and this is something that is not really discussed in the G20 that much, is that it depends on the assumption of what economists call instrument scarcity, right? That if you have national policy makers say that they're possessing um, two objectives, so for instance, you could have think of the US Fed uh, concerned about inflation, so it needs to keep inflation at target, but it's also geared towards trying to meet full employment. Um, but suppose they only have one instrument at their axis, and if they do that, then they cannot fully offset the impact of their domestic objectives um, of policy initiatives abroad. So the literature started to move towards discussing instrument scarcity and how this was a limitation for not being able to internalize the effects of your, of your domestic policy initiatives on countries outside of this. Then in the early 1990s, Willem Boiter and Ken Kletzer, Ken Kletzer is someone who we all know here, um, started talking about the distinction between 
pecuniary and non-pecuniary externalities. And I think this is an important change here, again, which is something that has not really been brought into the G20 debate. When the spillovers of policy changes are pecuniary, then the assumption is, or foreign policy makers in principle, with a sufficient number of instruments can, can change it back. So for instance, if, if QE happens in, in the US and capital flows to EMEs, then one way, uh, one effect of this is going to be that EME currencies will appreciate. If EME countries, if EME country currencies appreciate, then central banks could possibly re respond by reducing their interest rates to make their, make their currencies relatively less attractive. Um, that, of course, wasn't an option, um, as I'll explain to, to, to our, our central bank governor, but that's one mechanism through which a QE externality can be, can be reciprocated because it's a pecuniary externality. But what plagues the problem for international policy coordination are the non-pecuniary externalities. And the non-pecuniary externalities could operate in the following way. So you have QE, you have capital flooding into EMEs, it appreciates the EME currency, and that affects the tradable sector. So for instance, it could affect the manufacturing sector. And since a lot of learning by doing and growth productivity uh, effects uh, uh, are localized in the tradable sector, that has more pernicious harm to the economy. And, and, and I think the, the G20 discussion on non-pecuniary externalities is something that, is, that has not got adequate attention, um, in addition to the fact that instrument scarcity could be, could be a problem. So we have these papers by Cooper, we have these papers by Koichi Hamada, which were fundamental papers. We moved to the 90s with Boiter and Kletzer. Then Jeff Sachs and Udis also showed in a Brookings paper in 1984, and this was something that was a little more rigorous, I think, at this point, was that they actually showed that the gains from policy coordination were small. And at most, there were a few percentage points of GDP, which, which kind of confirmed our priors that, that um, if countries basically want to maximize welfare, they should put their, they should put their own house in order. Yeah? Now, <clears throat> And there's some other papers um, uh, here, and I'm going to try and map this in terms of the challenges that EMEs face. For instance, Rogoff 1985 also shows that efforts to coordinate internationally might interfere with the commitment to follow time-consistent policies. And then most recently, I think the work that has gotten a lot of attention, and which has also partly been used by the US as a defense of QE, is, is the work by, by John Taylor and Bullard, who argue that because the gains from policy coordination are small, if you look at the decentralized equilibrium, I, I don't want to throw this term out to you at the, at the end of the day, but, but think of the decentralized equilibrium in which each central bank follows an appropriately domestic-oriented monetary policy. That will closely approximate the first best equilibrium while avoiding the incentive effects and side effects of international coordination. So those are all rationales for why the gains from international policy, policy coordination are, are limited. And, and, and the main thrust of the literature from all these papers has subsequently been that, that these are small, and these are small under normal conditions. Although well, Stephen, when we were talking at lunch, um, uh, uh, highlighted a set of, of, of other papers that actually say that when you have nonlinearities or big shifts, then you know, these gains can actually be quite large. So there is, there is, there is recognition, of, <laughs> recognition of this. But let me then get back to what, what India's conundrum was during this, this period. You can think of the RBI as, as a major central bank um, in an emerging market economy, also lacking a full set of policy instruments um, in which to respond to cross-border repercussions of Fed policy. In the, in the, taper, in the, in the run-up to, to, to the taper tantrum, when the rupee was appreciating, um, allowing the rupee to appreciate sharply would have had negative implications for India's tradable sector. And this would have been an example of the boiter kletzer non-pecuniary externality. If you cut interest rates, if the RBI at that time had cut interest rates to prevent this appreciation of the currency, it would have exacerbated an already bad inflation problem, right? Because we knew in the run-up to the taper tantrum, inflation was, was skyrocketing. And therefore, India's optimal strategy would have been for the Fed to loosen less. That's what it should have wanted out of, out of the Fed. Now let's go a little bit further and go to uh, when the Fed started tapering. When the Fed started f tapering, there was a sudden stop, capital flows reverse direction, 
If the RBI did not respond, that would have led to confidence problems. And the RBI, therefore, was forced to raise rates even though its growth outlook was deteriorating because it was worried about confidence problems. And therefore, it would have been better from India's point of view for the Fed to move slowly and to tighten less. So instrument scarcity is a, is a, is a major issue, in part because capital controls can be seen as, as, as somewhat ineffective, and therefore you, you worry about what EMEs can do in a, in a situation like this. So let me end with, with, with four kind of um, suggestions that, 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 that have been offered by, by the literature. If you, if you think that there is scope for um, cooperation in, in, in monetary and fiscal policy, uh, uh, one, one issue here is that these are too politicized, right? And therefore, cooperation should basically focus on technical issues like prudential supervision and regulation. There seems to be more scope there and, and certainly much more avenues for information sharing. Um, and monetary and fiscal policy are also plagued by some of the problems that I talked about. Number two, cooperation is most likely when it is institutionalized. And when it's institutionalized, the costs of reaching agreements are not high, and that makes it easier to find, to, to, to arrive at agreements. Number three, cooperation is most likely when it is concerned with preserving an existing set of policies and behaviors, i.e. when it preserves a policy regime rather than altering a policy regime. And successful cooperation should be of the regime preserving type and not of the regime altering type. And finally, and this is just more of a broader point, is that if you expect coordinated responses on monetary, macro, and financial issues, I think at the backdrop you require a broad committee of nations. And if there if there's disgruntlement or if there are issues either on the economic front or the non-economic front, that's going to that's going to mitigate uh, the effectiveness of a coordinated response on monetary, macro, and financial issues. Thank you. Uh, why? Yeah. Steve, would you uh, uh, care to respond since uh, what Chetan said? Uh, and in the morning, uh, you mentioned, uh, I think, uh, the G20 uh, kind of did very well uh, when, it was, uh, when there was a crisis. Is it condemned to remain a crisis prevention organization, or can it do better in peacetime? Based on what Chetan said, it seems to me that you know, it's just going to be a crisis uh, management rather than a crisis prevention. Would you like to share your thoughts, given that you've been embedded in this process for, for a long time with your experience and wisdom? Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the floor, you could also engage, if you have questions to any of the panelists, you could also please engage uh, with the panelists. Yes, after uh, Stephen has made his remarks. Um, uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Chetan. Um, that was... <coughs> really great and I learnt a lot um, and I just wanted to uh, give you some quick responses. Um, I guess the first point uh, I would make is that um, I think the academics have a conundrum which is that you're right, the literature says basically the gains from cooperation are relatively small. And, and that applies generally to monetary policy because that's easier to model than, than fiscal policy. So a lot of these results are, are based on um, uh, monetary policy issues. And also, obviously, uh, the, the, the effects are most obvious because it, could, because it comes quickly through the exchange rate and, uh, um, and monetary policy is, is clearly gonna be uh, a faster actor on uh, demand. Um, so, but the conundrum is that actually there was a reasonable amount of cooperation in uh, 2008, 2009, and initially it was mostly on the monetary front. Uh, you had um, the Fed, the ECB uh, primarily, and then, then the Bank of England, BOJ, uh, they came in with 
big amounts of coordinated liquidity support. Um, so why did this happen? Um, and I think there are possibly, um, the, the, there, there are a couple of possible explanations. One is that there is now, as, as you referred to, some increasing in academic support for the view that um, the results you normally find, which is that the gains from cooperation are pretty small, um, don't apply once you get into extreme circumstances. So there is some good modeling work that was done at the, at the, the IMF uh, by Doug Laxton uh, was in the lead on this, which basically tried to model what happened once you got out of normal circumstances. Um, and I don't pretend to understand the technicalities of it, uh, but essentially um, it started from a, from a proposition that the world was generally linear so most of the relationships were, were linear and therefore um, reactions were relatively small um, over most of the, the uh, experiences that the country went through. But once you got into extreme circumstances, things seemed to change. Uh, there were a couple of, if I remember rightly, there were a couple of uh, examples of this. One was when interest rates start to get down to very, very low levels, and therefore you start to get into questions of um, uh, the effectiveness of monetary policy actions, in particular interest rates. If interest rates are, are virtually zero, then there's very little scope for doing anything. QE is an alternative, but, but relatively untried. Arguably, once you get to the, the levels of uh, QE that you're seeing now, again, marginal increases have less and less of an effect. So those are some circumstances where you would expect the world to be non-linear. Um, and also uh, questions of credit constraints. Uh, where, where, you're, where you're looking at a, a credit crunch, again, the normal relationships between interest rates and investment and consume, consumer behavior start to break down. Uh, so they did modeling on this and they showed, I think fairly conclusively, that um, once you got into these regions, these, these exceptional times, exceptional circumstances, uh, where existing policy, uh, policies don't, didn't work as effectively, you started to get much bigger effects from coordination, much bigger benefits. Um, basically, what, what was happening was that... Um, uh, the, you couldn't get much domestic action from policies. Uh, therefore, uh, but, but once, you, uh, once you started to coordinate the actions, then the multiplier effect, which is you know, the basis for all of these coordination results, uh, these multiplier effect, effects cross-border started to become much more significant. Now, to a simple-minded person like me, uh, what, that's telling, what that is telling you is that um, there are some real economic benefits for the behavior that you saw in the, during the crisis. You started to see uh, central banks coordinating because on the, on the one hand, um, the costs of coordinating went down in other words, um, the, the popular support for action that was beneficial uh, was going up. Um, yes, of course, all central banks had national mandates, um, but they could see 
more clearly that um, their own meeting their own national mandates was better suited by coordinating internationally. <coughs> and the, the, uh, the benefits for that individual country started to go up. So purely in cost-benefit terms, it made more sense to coordinate. Um, now, that leads me to, to wonder whether we are, whether that was also the rationale behind the coordination of fiscal policies uh, back in 2009. Um, and I was going to say this morning, but ran out of time, that I wonder whether we're starting to get into that territory now um, where fiscal policies I, I personally believe that um, uh, monetary policies are becoming less and less effective, especially as you get negative interest rates. QE is already well entrenched in a number of countries. There's not much more action to be done on monetary policy, uh, or at least if you pushed rates more negative, you would be fairly uncertain about what the implications would be. Um, so the question is, should, if there is a demand shortage globally, um, with most EMEs slowing, with the exception of India, um, with most advanced countries pretty much in the doldrums, whether, uh, and then you get shocks such as Brexit or whatever else comes along, whether, whether you're actually getting to the territory where some form of demand stimulus is the right response, uh, and you can't do it on monetary policy, do you then turn to fiscal policies? Now, we know that there are even bigger national problems with coordinating fiscal policies. Um, people think that um, fiscal policies is essentially a national thing. Um, why on earth should, it, should country A coordinate with country B? The answer may be that you're start, if you're getting to exceptional circumstances, uh, so the effects are bigger, the benefits are bigger, the costs may be smaller uh, in political terms, whether you start to consider that's that form of action. And I think... Uh, Amar's a, a, a bigger fan than I am of um, communique language, but I mean there was language coming out of the finance minister's meetings uh, over the last six months suggesting that they, there, was a, there was a slight, subtle change in willingness of countries to consider fiscal policy. I throw out two more bits of evidence and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. Uh, one is that uh, our new chancellor in the UK, uh, Philip Hammond, one of his first actions was to say, mm, you know what, we might need to reset fiscal policy. That's a huge domestic statement. The other is uh, Prime Minister Abe, who gave a speech, I think it was about two weeks ago, saying, um, you know what, we need a, we need a stimulus package, uh, and it should be both monetary and fiscal, uh, but at least half of it should come from fiscal. Now, who knows, but uh, I think the, the, there may just be a few um, seeds blowing around in the wind suggesting that uh, we may be entering a different phase in terms of coordination. I just want to um, build on these two with some, some numbers. Um, if you remember when you, know, we, when you went into the uh, global financial crisis, uh, the country in perpetual deficit and driving, in some sense, global external demand was the United States with a huge uh, uh, f uh, trade and current account deficit. Uh, and what happened after the, after the global financial crisis was a dramatic shift uh, 
in impetus in global demand. So between 2008 and 2012, um, emerging markets other than China and Korea went uh, from a small uh, surplus to a deficit in excess of $500 billion. So about the same magnitude of a deficit as the United States. You know, historically something, you know, enormous in size. And what happened during that same period was Europe went from a significant surplus to an obscene surplus, uh, led by Germany. Um, but it really was, so you could see, therefore, the, this problem of coordination uh, in the sense that emerging markets had become the drivers of global demand, but the question was, where was the future? And when the crunch came that Chetan mentioned, which is uh, the, the uh, uh, taper tantrum, the other side of it was the beauty contest, which is suddenly the market started looking at current account deficits and fiscal deficits and penalizing those countries which had larger current account deficits and fiscal deficits and countries from Turkey to India to South Africa to Brazil all then started simultaneously contracting. Okay. But in the, on the other side, there was no change in Europe. So there was actually, I'm just trying to put this context of, of global coordination, so there was actually a lack of coordination at that point in time, and we know, as was just heard, that monetary policy was not really, in a way, monetary policy was almost counterproductive because it was a beggar thy neighbor policy, okay? So in that context, what happened to fiscal policy? So, and, and Thomas mentioned this, so uh, in, in the, you know, the German view was that fiscal policy would be counterproductive because it would really lead to a buildup of unsustainable debt and would lead you into a territory which would then require even worse outcomes, okay? So if you remember the discussions that happened, 2009, uh, everybody agreed that there was a need for fiscal expansion. But as quickly as 20, 2010, there were countries that had shift. Germany was never really on the bandwagon of a big fiscal expansion, but went along. But by 2010, it was voicing reservations. But the big turn came in the Toronto G7 summit, where there was a commitment made to try and focused on a reduction of debt. And of course, the reduction in debt mean contraction of fiscal policy. And I was saying to Stephen, with a change of government in the UK, the new chancellor also signed on to that. So in the G20 discussions, there was only the US and a handful of emerging markets making the case for fiscal policy. The IMF has always made a case for fiscal policy, but it had been relatively re reluctant to do the name calling. So the IMF statements were always that those who have the room for fiscal maneuver should consider appropriate fiscal expansion and the other countries should think about other kinds of reforms including structural reforms and the like. And, you know, but the reality is that nothing happened in the G20, but it wasn't because so much that, you know, there was a political inability to deliver something that was agreed upon, but because there wasn't a lack of agreement on what macro policy coordination was about in this particular case. So I think on fiscal policy, it's fair to say that, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't really a kind of a consensus. And the other thing I would say, and may not be a politically correct thing to say, but let me be, let me be a little bit pro politically incorrect. The European voice changed dramatically after the global financial crisis. I remember 
in the pre-global financial crisis, when there were discussions of macro policies, there were as many European voices as there were European countries. But after the global financial crisis, there was very much led by Germany and in some sense supported by the Commission, a much more homogenous view about what macro policy coordination was about, and it certainly did not include fiscal stimulus. So, you know, that, that was part of, I think, you know, there was, a, there, was a, there was a sense after the crisis that we have to stick together, and, you know, although many European countries were not really signed on that austerity was a good thing, it was not something that they challenged in the G20 context. Yes, uh, a few thoughts before then. Sorry, I, 7.30 I would have to leave, so I'll just say a few things and then I'll be back tomorrow morning, of course. Uh, just a few things here uh, with the German perspective. First of all, I would like to, to contribute or to share that these our domestic debates on our fiscal situation and our, uh, you know, uh, foreign uh, trade or foreign um, current account situation uh, in the general public, but also in the sort of more the knowledgeable economist circles are purely domestic. You know, it's only domestic considerations. I mean, it's really unbelievable. This is the discussions today, which I find very rich and uh, uh, stimulating. You know, I've sort of brought this insight to me very clearly that when we talk about these things in Germany, it's domestic first and last, you know, and all these ideas about even the EU and policy coordination within the G20 basically does not, is not brought into the picture. With regard to the current account, I already uh, mentioned in the afternoon and then uh, Ratin Roy gave uh, a certain interpretation which, of course, he will get a lot of applause for that in Germany, saying that, of course, our huge current account surplus, it's a result of our superior, you know, competitiveness, you know. I have a different view. I mean, I'm, I'm in a minority position here in, in, in the German debate, you know. I think to, to a large extent that's the result of distributional shifts that we have in, in, in Germany with, with regard to the uh, increase of corporate profits, then they are retained, they're not being invested, and then also the share of the rich in the uh, uh, GDP has increased significantly. And they're also saving, you know. So you have this shift of GDP towards uh, those actors or sectors of the, of the national economy that are saving and then not spending the money. And that that's also is a, it's a large factor. That's the explanation that I would like to see. With regard to the public budget, you know, of course we have a, a public sector surplus here. It, it, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, it's absolutely uh, striking. And with regard to our federal government's budget situation, you know, it's, it's an, um, a balanced budget, and they're very proud. I mean, that's the signature success of the present coalition government, and definitely nobody, but I mean, going beyond uh, the, these parties in power, nobody really dares to question this. And actually, personally, I'm also fiscally conservative person. I wouldn't want... Uh, the de for a lot of reasons, uh, the, the deficit spending, again, fiscal stimulus. Um, I'm, I'm completely in, in favor of redistribution, and higher taxes for the rich, wonderful. Let the government, I mean, we have, we have no more uh, wealth tax in, in, in Germany. We have a highly uh, uneven um, tax system that's uh, benefiting, you know, the, the, the rich at the cost also of the middle classes. So if the, I'm all for the government raising more revenues and then come in with the fiscal uh, stimulus, but not on the basis of deficit spending. So I'm very sorry, but uh, I, I have to leave. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, um, I know, I, I think the focus is policy coordination. So the question I have is, while we have this debate in monetary and fiscal, I'm personally convinced that uh, that part of the role of G20, it's pretty much, um, it's not going to achieve much more. However, there, are, there is one area which has been, 
which is related more to the transmission of crises, prevention of crises, which has to do more with macrofinance, which is the interface of monetary policy and finance. But in the current debate, in light of the previous discussion, I'd like to say the issue of financial stability, bro broadly speaking. And it would be useful to hear what sort of policy coordination has worked or not worked. There were four pillars which were identified. Uh, and as far as I think Daryl Duffy has written a paper for the ECB taking stock, and there have been a couple of others recently, which says there was the resilience of the banking system, there's the swaps and, uh, you know, and the derivative markets and the too big to fail, if I remember those are the four pillars. And really the only thing that has succeeded any 